Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our session on BC201. I hope all of you all are doing well. Um, yes, it's so nice to see all of you all locked in on time. And it's nice to be back to our class. Well, today we're going to study on the third chapter. It's more to do on the timeline of reformation, revival, and restoration and patient. So even before we could begin with our class, can I request one of you all to start the class with a word of prayer? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this beautiful day. Thank you, Lord, for this time, this session, Father God, that you have given us. Thank you, Lord, for gathering us together, Lord, to sit at your feet and study and meditate your word. Father God, even as we journey to the book of Acts and study about the about revival and about the visitation of the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit, the demonstration of the Holy Spirit. Father God, we thank you, Father God, and that you have chosen us, O oh Lord. We are privileged, Father God, to study, to study your word in depth, Lord. We thank you. We thank you for this grace. Thank you for this privilege. I pray, Lord, open the eyes of our understanding, Father God. Let every eye of understanding be open in the name of Jesus. Lord, we thank you and we bless you, Lord. Yes. Lord, even as we study, we pray, Father God, to bless. We ask you to bless our dear pastor. Lord, we thank you for bringing her back, Lord, healthy. Father, we thank you, Lord. We pray that, Lord, let your spirit anoint her, Father God, and let whatever she teaches, Father God, may it be your words, Father God. Lord, we thank you and we bless you, Father God. Lord, you are the prayer answering God. Thank you for answering our prayers. And together, Father God, we say this prayer in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you, Rosalyn. Thank you. So today we're going to cover the timeline from this chapter on Reformation, where we get to travel to about 2,000 years of the church history in a chronological, uh, where it's been listed the key events and the lives of people who have impacted the church, especially the early church fathers, the reformers, the revivalists, and the missionaries. So we see the purpose into looking into this is looking into the history of the churches for us to learn from the past, to gain an insight and and how God's been dealing with this people. And we see how the war of God works from time to time. And also for us to recognize God's pattern of working with the church. So it is for us to understand this. It is important for us to look into this complete picture and recognize how the connection between the Reformation and the Revivals and how the restoration of the church is there. And we also see on different missions and the church. So we must know the history correctly for us to understand and interpret the present. And also it will help us to make the decision for the future. So here we see uh, time and again in the Old Testament how the Father have told us how the things were repeated and were recorded. So God instructed Moses. God instructed Moses to write down everything that was happening between them, how God was moving among the people. So everything was recorded. We see in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 4, Verse 9, it says, only take heed to yourself and diligently keep yourself, lest you forget the things your eyes have seen, and lest they depart from your heart all the days of your life and teach them to your children and your 
grandchildren. So it is very important for us to keep the events recorded. Why? Because it's been instructed by God so that when we record, we can teach that to our children and to our generation that is coming. So God's work will be known. So he didn't want us to forget things, but then God wants our children and our great-grandchildren to know. So the only way for us to keep them updated is to record the events that is happening. Even we see in the book of Joshua, chapter 4, verse 1 to 7, it says, And it came to pass that all the people had completely crossed over the Jordan, that the Lord spoke to Joshua, saying, Take for yourself twelve men from the people, one man from every tribe. And he commanded them, saying, Take for yourself twelve stones from here, out of the midst of the Jordan, from the place where the priest's feet stood for. So you shall carry them over with you and leave them in the lodging place where you lodge tonight. Then Joshua called twelve men. You know, he instructed the children of Israel to do so. Why did God instruct this to Joshua? But why do you think? So the significant event that took place when Joshua and the and the 12 tribe of people, when they carried the Ark of the Covenant and they, the hyper, when the priest stepped into the river Jordan, how the water parted. This even to be remembered, and this needs to be recorded and and for, I mean, and be told to the generation who are coming. So God instructed Joshua to pile up that stone a stone of pillar there so that the story can be remembered and told to the generation to come how God worked miracles among them. So after crossing Jordan, this is what happened. God instructs his people to set up a memorial, something that will help succeeding the generation to remember what the Lord has done time and again among them. We also see in the book of Psalms, chapter 44, Verse 1 to 4. Can I request one of you to turn to Psalms chapter 44, verse 1 to 4? We are on page 33. Psalms chapter 44, verses 1 to 4. We have heard with our ears, O God, our fathers have told us the deeds you did in their days, in days of old. You drove out the nations with your hand, but but them you planted, you afflicted the peoples and cast them out, for they did not gain possession of the land by their own sword, nor did their own arm save them. But it was your right hand, your arm, and the light of your countenance, because you favored them. You are my king, O God. Command victories over Jacob, for Jacob. Amen. Thank you, Rosalie. So here, time and again, we see it is so important for us to remember how God works through our Father, work through the people of Israel, so that the God who did those miracles, the God who lived among them, is the same God who is living among us. The same God can perform a greater miracle than that with us. So what happens when we read through those stories, through those scripture passages, the faith has been created in us. There's a, gen there's a faith has been generated with us so that we can apply it to our day, to our situation, to our circumstance that we are going through our time. So these stories will only encourage us and help us to trust in God more and to expect God to move in the similar way or much greater way in our life. So with that, we will move on to the first century. What happened from AD 1 to AD 100, 100? So what happened? AD is an abbreviation for Anno Domini, 
which is a Latin phrase meaning in the year of a Lord. It was referring to the year of Christ's birth. So the early dates must be considered as approximate. So whatever date timeline we are going through right now, it should be approximately considered because um, there's no fixed date that we can uh, we can put a point to it and say this is what happened in so and so date. Okay, so somewhere between 10 BC and 3 BC, we see that Jesus was born in Bethlehem. So in AD 30 or in AD 33, we see Jesus was crucified and he was rose from death. And we see that in AD 30 as a reference point to start from there. So in AD 30, we see the day of Pentecost. That's where in Acts chapter 1, we see the outpouring of the Spirit of the 120 the disciples and apostles who were gathered at that upper room and how the Spirit of the Lord descended on each one in the form of the tongues of fire and how Peter ministered to people filled with boldness and courage and the church was birthed. We see the book of Acts covers approximately 40 years from the birth of the New Testament church. That is from the day of Pentecost onwards. We see 40 years it covers. And in AD 44, we see uh, Herod and Grippa dies in Acts 12. And there's a certain historical date and we later see Barnabas and Paul begins their missionary journey, the first missionary journey in Acts 13. And in AD 52, <coughs> sorry, sorry, AD 52, Apostle Thomas, one of the disciples of Jesus, he arrives in India at a place called Malabar and uh, in the Coromandel coast in India, and he finds the church there. Now, when Apostle Thomas came to India, it was not a very easy time because India is a place where different faith was practiced. But when the history says when Thomas came to India for the very first time, he reached the uh, coast, the southern part of India towards the Kerala, he did signs and wonders. God moved through Apostle Thomas through signs and wonders, which made the people of India to believe it. And this changed their heart and their mind, and they believed in this new God, Jesus. Through the signs and wonders, he, were, he was able to share the gospel with the, with the people in India. And slowly he moved towards Chennai, Tamil Nadu. And from there, again, he started to share the word. And later we see in the history that he was martyred in the same place in Tamil Nadu. And in AD 64, we see Nero, Nero launches persecution, the fire of Rome. What happened? It was all a setup. This fire was not uh, uh, intended to happen as an accident, but then it was well planned by the Nero group. So in AD 66 to 68, we see Paul, uh, Paul and Peter were put to death by Nero the key persecution of this fire of hope. They were eventually blamed, the Christians were eventually blamed for this fire, which was a, a very devastating fire that destroyed the home. So Nero persecuted, I mean, he put both of them, Paul and Peter, to death because of this. And he used Christians as the human torches to illumine his garden. Like he was the father of persecution, you can say. During his time, he persecuted Christians uh, by allowing them in the Colossae. Uh, you know, he, he fed the wild animals with the Christians. And then he burned them on the cross. Uh, put up as a, a human torch in the in his garden. And in AD 70, we see 
the Jerusalem was destroyed by the Roman general and the future emperor. So we see that Titus, uh, Jewish revolt against Roman authority and Christians do not take part in this revolt and they relocated to Ella in Jordan. And later in AD 90, we see the Council of Germania, which took place according to the Jewish historians Josephus. Well, we also see uh, the Hebrew Old Testament was complete and no more canonical writings were composed after the reign of Azarsaurus. So the Jews in the Council of Germania made a firm acknowledgement of the Hebrew Old Testament book as a holy scripture and they confirmed the canon of the Hebrew scriptures. Okay, later we see the book of Revelation was written in 95 <clears throat> and in AD 96 to 150 we see the growing and the collection into the groups of the New Testament books was recognized and during this period all the Gospels and all the Paul's epistles were known and recognized in the church and we see the way then maybe 98 apostle john dies at about 100 years of age again all these are approximate and in 99 ad we see the new testament writings are completed and in 100 first christians were reported in monaco algeria and sri lanka that means what we see by the first century, the Christians have reached out of Jerusalem. Christians were known as a religion in other parts of the country. Now we move on to the second century on page 34. It is very briefly mentioned here. I would request each of you all to please go through it in the notes and understand the process. <laughs> So what happened in the second century? We see the persecution has been continued. What was happening in the early church is still been continued is the persecution. And also in the second century is where we see there were heresies being birthed and which was a major danger within the church. So the church needed to address these heresies. So what are those? heresies. Similar to the New Age movement, which we also see now, those days they have Gnosticism. So we see Gnosticism. What is Gnosticism? Anyone in the class? Anyone? Yes, please. I think this is brought about by Greek thinking. You see, in the world, there were two types of thinking then. There was the Hebrew thinking, and the, the Hebrews took like... Uh, took time to be linear, but the Greeks, the Greek thought of life to be two-dimensional. They took uh, evil and, and to be completely separate from good. So they thought that uh, they were thinking that uh, Jesus Christ could not have been both man and God. So they were thinking that uh, God is all good, he cannot mix with evil, and they thought that man is all evil, he cannot be good. That is the brief thing I can say, Pastor. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Rebecca. Yes. So, this Gnostic Gnosticism consider the principal element of salvation. So they had this direct knowledge of the supreme divinity, which is in form of mystical or Erostic insight. So many Gnostic texts dealt not in the concept of sin 
and repentance, but with illusions and enlightenment. So they had their own teaching, and this teaching was trying to spread and flourish among the Christian groups in the Mediterranean world. And this was happening, this was birth in the second century. And we see the early church fathers had to stand against such heresies or teachings that was been spread by these people. And they had to re-instruct the gospel. They didn't go about preaching against Gnosticism, but they went on uh, went on uh, teaching the word, teaching the right gospel to people, so that the people can understand the right from wrong. Next, we see Marconism. Marconism was an attempt to reduce the scriptures, both the Hebrew and the Christian scriptures, to a few select books. And we also see Montanism. Montanism was kind of, a, again, a charismatic moment that went astray with new revelation and prophecies and judgments on the other hand, which they came up with. So it was a institutionalized religion, which was practiced by certain group or certain member who lived by a rule that requires and works beyond those of the early ladies. So what happened? They went on spreading this. They first applied to a certain Christian group uh, and then it started moving. They started using monasticism uh, among those set of groups. Though it is not identical or practical, this is in the religion, such as the other religion that was present those days, like uh, it can be Buddhism or Hinduism or Jainism. But then they started to introduce this monasticism and practice among the Greek monarchos. So this aspect of monasticism does not extend beyond the culture or the language or that uh, 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 or the uh, the re religious terminology of so-called Abrahamic, but then they did try to implement among the group. And later, we we'll see in AD 107, Polycarp, appointed bishop of Smyrna, was a disciple of Apostle John and appointed bishop of Smyrna. So he was one of the leader who fought against all these heresies that was coming up. Uh, we can study in detail about Polycarp in the next class. Okay, and uh, in AD 108, Ignatius of Antioch, the early church father. <laughs> Just give me a minute. Yeah, so the Ignatius of Antioch, what happened? He was a student again of Apostle John, the apostle who lived long. So his writing provided an inside teaching to the early church. Well, he also wrote the seven letters to the churches, which has been preserved, covering several matters, including the heresies and the deity of Christ and the Lord's table, the structure of the local church with the other bishops and the deacons were formed at those days. And we see in AD 125, he talks about the Aristides, right? The early church apologetics. Why was it needed? Yes, to defend the gospel against the heresies that was arising. So Aristides wrote the book of apologetics and he defended the faith and he presented to the emperor of Hadrian. Just give me a minute, please.
Thank you so much. Sorry about it. Um, yeah, sub video setting for the class to be written, right? Okay. Is there any comments? Okay. Okay, so in AD 150 to AD 190, we see the compiling of the canon where the books of the New Testament were selected and compiled together. And later we see in, uh, we're just going through the numbers from these books, the timeline, we are on page 35. You can go through it on your own. In AD 150, we see the old Latin version of the Bible was made available based on the translation of the Greek Septuagint. And in 155, we see Justin Martha writes his first apology. And in 55, again, we see Bishop Polycarp Martyr at the age 84. So this martyrdom took place around 155. So we need to see, uh, I would request you all to take and uh, um, read a detailed version, read about Polycarp and Ignatius of Antioch is very important. These two people I want you all to please have your personal research done and study on these two fathers. Okay, so what happened was the story of the martyrdom is preserved by the Eusebius in the early church. The history of the early church through AD 323 and later we see about Irenaeus, the father of Lugdon. Yeah, so Irenaeus was born in 120 to 140 in Asia Minor and he died in 200 or 203 AD. <coughs> oh, his uh, exact birth date is unknown. Irenaeus was born of a Greek parents in Asia Minor. So his own works established a few biographical points such as uh, that he as a child heard and saw Polycarp, the last known living connection with the Apostle of John. So before that age, Christians were martyred in 155 AD. So we see Eusebius of Caesar also notes that after the persecution, Irenaeus succeeded the martyr of Potinius as the bishop of Lugdunan. According to Eusebius, who wrote a history of the church in 4th century, we see that Irenaeus, prior to his becoming bishop, had served as a missionary to southern Gaul and as a peacemaker among the churches of Asia Minor, had been disrupted by an heresy. So they were. So the yeah. So in this era, we era we see that Irenaeus lived and was a time of expansion and inner tensions in the church. So in many cases, we see that Irenaeus acted as a mediator between various contending factions. The Church of Asia Minor continued to celebrate Easter on the same day and. Uh, you know, like the uh, Passover, according to the Jews, when they had celebrated. And there were many other dates they had to commemorate according to that. So Arrhenius adopted a totally negative and unresponsive attitude towards Marion, uh, who was another leader in Rome, towards Gnosticism. He wants to come against this type of heresy. So there were a lot of uh, ups and downs. Uh, in the teaching, so they had to correct it and stand against those heresies. So we see uh, Iranians asserted in a very positive manner later, validating the Hebrew Bible, that is the Old Testament, which the Gnostic denied, claiming that it has upheld the law of the Creator God of God. Though Iranians did not actually refer to two testaments, one old and one new, he prepared the way for this terminology. He asserted and he validated the New Testament as a time when concern for the unity and difference between the two parts of the Bible that was developing. 
so we see uh, the works that he claimed to uh, to uh, to come against the heresies was he was retreating the gospel retreating the gospel the teaching of the apostles which he received directly from the apostles of john with that we will move on to clement of alexandria so clement of alexandria was a Latin name given to Titus Flavius Clemens. He was born in 150, 150 AD. Or there's another, because these dates are not too uh, accurate as we know. So it says uh, 190 to 200 AD. And yeah, so he was a Christian theologian, teaches new Christian in Alexandria. So he wrote three books to expound his teaching on the Christian faith so we see that uh, during his time the fourth century bishop he was the fourth century bishop and the parents of clements were athenius pagans so there is little significant information about his early life so as a student clement traveled to various centers of learning in italy and in the eastern mediterranean area and he converted to Christian by his last teacher, Pantanius, who reputedly a former Stoic philosopher and the first recorded president of the Christian Catechist School of Alexandria at Alexandria. So Clement succeeded his mentor and he headed the school in one. Okay, head in the school. I don't want to give you the dates because the dates were no way matching. So during the next two decades, Clement was an intellectual leader of the Alexandrian Christian community. So he wrote several ethical and theological works and biblical commentaries to uh, to come against the Gnostic heresies that was in those periods. So he engaged in polemics with the Christian, who were suspicious of an intellectualized Christianity. And he, or, and he educated people who later became a theological and uh, the ecclesiastical leaders like um, Alexander the Great or the Bishop of Jerusalem. So he educated and raised many leaders who can come against such heresies in future. Um, Yes, give me a minute. Sorry. Yeah. And with that, we have done almost with the second century. We will move on to the third century, AD 201 to AD 300. Here we see many leaders who were raised in the first Christian state of Turkey would find the modern day Turkey like leader like Edessa and then we see in 200 to 20 later to Lien. Just give me a minute. Okay, uh, Tertullian and BC, Oregon in uh, AD 245 and in AD 248, we see 1000th anniversary of Rome. Yet all is not very joyous there. Still, there's a threat increasing among the Christians. And in 250, we see Emperor Dacius there. And then in AD 300, we see about a man called Anthony the Great. Anthony the Great or Anthony of Egypt. We need to learn more about it here because this is the period where we see uh, the they call the monk. Uh, the monastery was birthed and the monks, the uh, monks were started. We see uh, Anthony the Great in AD 251 to 356, 
Anthony the Great or Anthony of Egypt goes into a desert as a hermit. And um, yeah, we. Yeah, so it is a religious hermit, and one of the earliest desert fathers, they were also known as desert fathers, and they consider the founder and father of organized Christian monasticism. So his rule represented one of the first attempts to codify the guidelines for monastic living. So this monastic living had certain rules and regulations that they had to follow. So the disciples of Saint Paul of Thebes or Anthony began to practice an aesthetic life that is a life of sacrifice at the age of 20. At a very early age in his life, he started. And about 15 years, he withdrew himself to solitude to a mountain by night called Pispa, where he lived about uh, you know, 286 to 305, about, yes, we see about 20 years. During the course of this time, he began a legendary combat against the devil, withstanding uh, several temptation that was coming against him, against the Christian theology. So about uh, in 305, he emerged from his retreat to instruct and organize a monastic life of the hermits. And we see there were many people who had known about him, joined this group, lived a similar kind of lifestyle. So he moved to a mountain in the eastern desert between the Nile and the Red Sea, where the... Sorry, sorry, excuse minute. Sorry, thank you. So between the Nile and the Red Sea, so what we see here is he remained there and people he started being recognized and noticed by people in that area. And there's in that area, and people started to visit this monastery, which was outskirts of uh, this place in Egypt. So uh, people started coming there with different requests. They started to come there for deliverance, for healing, or just to hear the word. And they started ministering to people from this place. So the early monks who followed Anthony into the desert considered themselves as uh, vanguard of God's army. So they were uh, they were uh, they were uh, disciplining themselves through fasting and Lord of prayer. And you see, slowly they started ministering to people in the spiritual gifts. So. They were ministering to people in healing, and there were a lot of deliverance that was happening. Anthony of Egypt was known for his deliverance ministry because he personally encountered a lot of temptation by the enemy, and he overcame all that by the word of God. So when you read about him, I, I would encourage you to read about him because in one class we cannot cover most of the so request you all to read about these desert fathers and how the ministry was birthed and how many monks were added to this group and and all the monks despite the time and season you see they all flow in the same kind of spiritual gifts they all carried the same gifts of the spirit in them and they all lived a very aesthetic life very simple life they were known uh, to live a very simple uh, dependable on god kind of life so they did go into the city was only to get arms uh, their dressing sense also was very simple they got into a, a kind of you know a black dress long dark kind of black dress with a hood and uh, with a bell in their hand so they used to ring the bell to just to let the people know that they are coming uh, to collect the arms so that they can collect the arms go back to their monastery and live a very simple and a peaceful life so most of the time they spent in praying they spent in praying uh spent time in fasting because uh 
what they had received also was very less so they spent a lot of time in fasting and prayer and they ministered to people there and also we should understand they lived in the land of egypt where they were the land was possessed with the demonic powers so they had to uh, 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 depend on god depend on the spirit, gifts of the spirit to you know, exercise uh, exorcism Okay, they were gifted with that and uh, they saw many people coming to them with related to deliverance. Yeah, with that we will move on to the 4th century fathers. We have very less time, but because it has got to do with more of history, I would request you all to please study on certain uh, uh, certain uh, people where uh, God moved among them very powerfully so in fourth century we see the emperor about uh, dioration and um, yeah we can move to constantine the great where the christianity became the common religion the birth uh, the spread of christianity became much in this season under the leadership of constantine just give me a minute. Yeah, uh, let's look into Diocletian as well. Okay. Sorry. In AD 303, Emperor Diocletian persecutes church intending to wipe out the Christian, wipe out the church, and you know what happened, that whole thing fades. So Diocletian, is, his Latin name was Pius Aurelius Pelagius Diocletian. He was a Roman emperor. He was serving under the Roman emperor Carnesian. So when the co-emperor, Carnesian's brother, Numerian, was killed. Diocletian's army declared him to be the emperor. So what happened? But his domain was restricted to Asia Minor and possibly Syria. So Carnesius attacked Diocletian in 285 AD but was assassinated before achieving the victory. So which allowed Diocletian to become the sole Emperor. Here he sought to remove the military from the politics, and he established. Uh, uh, and he, he was the he was the spread of the influence of the compact religion throughout the empire, proclaiming himself and his co-rulers as gods. So he added the trapping of the uh, theocracy to the reign. And we see he seemed to be a very ruler. He was not compassionate about his people. So he issued four edicts decreeing the last great persecution of Christians. And he, uh, he wanted to eradicate the Christianity from the face of the earth. And we know what happened. He failed to do it. So with that, we will move on to Constantine the Great. Okay. So Constantine was born on February 27th into AD, AD and we see he was the first Roman emperor to profess Christianity. He not only initiated the evolution of the empire into a Christian state, but also provided the impulse for a distinctively Christian culture that prepared the way for the growth of the Western medieval culture. So Constantine was probably in the later 280s, uh, a typical product of the military governing class of the later third century. He was a son of Flavius Pelagius Constantius and an army officer, and his wife Helena. So in 293 AD, his father was raised to the rank of Caesar or the deputy emperor and was sent to serve under Augustus Maximian in the West. So in 289, 
Constantius had separated from Helena in order to marry a stepdaughter of Maximian. So we see Constantius was brought up in the Eastern Empire of the court of senior emperor Diocletian. So what happened? Constantine experienced a member of imperial court and uh, the rest of his history. So what happens is in one of the emperors uh, on his way, Constantine receives a vision of a cross when he was heading for a battle. So on his way to fight with co-emperor Maximus, Okay, and he comes up with this vision of a cross and he asks everyone to take up a cross to the battle. And they won the battle after that. The minute he won the battle, uh, he, he attributed this victory to the Christian God. So becoming, so what he did, he made, uh, uh, he became a supporter to the early church. He made Christianity as a, uh, a legalized religion and in the Roman Empire. So uh, Constantine and Licinius then rebuilt the destroyed churches, the buildings, and in the early church. This is how uh, the politics entered the church. So they became one one decision making and restored all the position that was confiscated from the church during the persecution time. Yes, there's a positiveness and there's also the negative side of it, both. And we also see uh, Constantine made baptism because he wanted to make everyone Christian. So he baptized everyone where the sprinkling baptism was birthed and many other uh, new system was birthed in the Christian and the church took the authority to make any big decisions in the place where the politics entered the church. We see the Christianity being very different from now onwards, not like before. Um, yeah, with that, we will stop for now and we will study in detail about each and every uh, very important. I choose selective fathers or the selective leaders and we can discuss on them in detail in the further class. Other than that, is that if there's anything that you would like to add on, please feel free. We will stop here. The minute we start with the fourth century, due to time. Um, yeah, but then I would request uh, the class to study on uh, Polycar and Ignatius of Antioch. These are the two people I would request the class to research and study on. Okay? So that when we do our homework, our learning will be much more than what we get from the class. Because um, there are so many leaders and all these leaders are very important. We cannot cover them in a in an hour. If there's anyone who'd like to add to today's class, you can, or we can end this class with a word of prayer. Okay. As I don't see any hands raised, we'll end the session with the word of prayer. Dear God, we thank you. We praise you for all the leaders. We see how the Lord moved time and again. We thank you, Lord, that you took a stand when there were heresies, where there, oh Father, that your word was established. Your word has crossed a different season, Lord, different season of reformation. We see time and again, you raised leaders, Lord, who can defend the gospel, who can defend the faith, oh Father. Lord, we pray that even as we study, Lord, even as we study, we pray that you will impart your wisdom into each of us, oh Father, that we may have the same passion, Lord, to know your word, to study your word, and to impact the people, impact the world for you, oh Father. Lord, we pray that, Lord, you will increase the zeal for your word in each of us, oh Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus, Holy Spirit, 
Spirit of God, I pray that you move in and through us, Lord Jesus, that our heart may be connected with you, connected with your word, O oh Father. May your name be glorified in every act of us, Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I would request each one to please go through our notes, read in detail about these church fathers and the desert fathers, monks, so that we know how the Lord raised leaders and how he used them to impact the world. Thank you so much and God bless. See you all in the next class. Thank you.